Good morning. We want to thank you for joining us today on this recorded message that we're going to be broadcasting uh, on Sunday morning. But thank you for tuning in whenever you do. Before I get started today, uh, I'm recording this on Friday, uh, right after the events that took place in Washington, D.C., where the Supreme Court made a very historic ruling on Roe versus Wade. We have made a specific and determined effort at Cross Creek Church not to involve ourselves in politics because politicians come and go and they know they're lying when they move their lips and political movements aren't here to last. We have made a specific effort to focus purely and 100% on Jesus. But I could not help but think of what happened this week and think that Jesus, who said, suffer the little children to come unto me, would be very pleased. See, Jesus has a special place in his heart for kids. They're the only people he ever said, if you hurt one of them or cause them to stumble, you should put a rock, take a rope and tie it around, put it around your neck and tie it to a rock and throw yourself into a river. He said, we come to know him as our as savior, like a little child. It was only for about children that Jesus rebuked the disciples when they tried to push them away. Jesus has a very special place for kids in his heart. So be kids are important to Jesus, then they're important to Cross Creek Church. So we want to today start our service off and give God a little praise for what might looks what might happen, uh, uh, some less abortions taking place, and we are unapologetically for Jesus, and I believe Jesus is unapologetically pro-life and wants every child to have the opportunity to breathe breath and come to know him as personal savior. Because Jesus died for the sinners, he also died for the unborn. So let's start today in prayer. Let's remember those women who have to make very difficult choices. And let's just ask that God bring someone into their life to help them make a choice that Jesus would have them to make a choice for life. Join me in prayer on this Sunday morning. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I could not help but praise you and thank you on Friday. I know it is not an end to a horrible, barbaric, racist practice of abortion, but I know it will save at least one life in this nation. Lord, forgive this nation for what it has done towards the unborn. Father, help young ladies and maybe even older ladies, Lord, to make a choice, to make a decision to keep that child. Father, help us who know Christ as our Savior to support that woman, to help her in every area she needs. Lord, if there's someone who's listening to this who has made a, a decision in their past, Lord, let them know that there is healing in Jesus' name, that you have forgiven them, and there is no judgment by people who truly know you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to meet in the online through the miracle of the internet. Lord, thank you so much for what happened on Friday. We give you praise. I know myself and many other people watching this have been praying for years and decades about this. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, that one little life will have the opportunity to breathe the breath of life. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We're going to be in Jonah chapter 1 and Jonah chapter 2 today as we continue our series, The Sweet Spot. Welcome back to our coverage of the NCAA Men's Volleyball Championships between Yale and North Carolina. If you're just joining us, it has been a roller coaster of an evening. Both teams now tied at two sets apiece. The winner of this final set will be the national champions. North Carolina leading by one. Yale and their team captain, Scott Sterling. Love that man. Don't we all? Trying desperately to hold them here, or it's all over. Match point for the Tar Heels. Jones preparing for what may be the last serve of his college career. And here we go. Excellent serve. Thompson setting up. Here comes the spike. Yale has to stop this return. Or oh, oh, deflected right into Scott Sterling's face. And yes. Yale ties it up. Unbelievable. Buckle up, ladies and gentlemen, because Scott Sterling's face has at the building. Take a gander at this replay. The angle at which Sterling deflects the ball off his skull is nothing short of perfection. Like watching Da Vinci paint with his face. Yale now on the prowl to take the lead. And Carolina setting up what is bound to be a devastating return. And here it comes. Oh, oh no! Sterling makes another tremendous save. And North Carolina is wasting no other no. pound. Oh. Sterling scores! Welcome to the heavyweight bout between Sterling's face and everything. 
something else. He looks as though he could be praying. The peaceful visage of head drama. We are all witnesses. Testify. Let us feast on the sweet nectar of instant replay. Wonderful save here, just complete sacrifice. The ball flies right past the blockers, into Stelly's awaiting face, back over the net, and then right back to Stelly's face like an obese homie pigeon. That man will leave this court today knowing he gave everything he could. If he leaves it all, the crowd is now on their feet. Like mythical Atlas who bore the weight of the world upon his back, so too has Scott Sterling bore this team upon his face. Yale has come back from the brink and is looking to put this one into the history books. That's word for Yale. Can Carolina finally push one through Sterling? Brown Sterling! Did you see that? Here comes the spike straight to the man! The man! The legend! His teammates help him to his feet. No! no! They raise him every Tears of joy. The tweets are tweeting. Hashtag Scott Sterling. The hospitals are preparing to receive the man himself. The eighth wonder of the world. The great wall of You know, just like that, life keeps coming at you. One hit after another. It seems like you're just able to endure the last hit and something else comes at you and knocks you back. But probably the worst impact, the worst hits that come at you repeatedly in your life are your relationships. You seemingly conquer and get one on the right path and another one has a problem and it hits you and brings you down to your knees. You see, you can't control life, but it is your choice on how you respond to people who let you down. How you choose to respond to people is really only you get to choose that, that reaction. See, you have a few options. You can run from relationships. You can run from all relationships. Isn't it odd that you're letting the worst people, the worst people who have impacted you negative, determine that the rest of your life? If you've had someone in your life that has hurt you so greatly, and now you are running from all other relationships, you are allowing that horrible person to still have control over you. Or you have another option. You can run to Jesus because Jesus will never let you down. Our theme verse today comes out of Hebrews 13, 5. For he said unto them, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You see, the ugliness of people, the hurtfulness of family, and how much a friend can stab you in the back, it will make you want to run from people or it will make you want to run to Jesus. You have two options and two choices to make in what direction you will go. You see, as we look at the life of Jonah today, <clears throat> Jonah could not get past the ugliness and the evilness of the citizens of Nineveh and what they had done. They were horrible people. They were cruel in how they treated their prisoners and the torture they did to people. It is disgusting what they wanted. Jonah wanted nothing to do with them. So he had a choice. Instead of running to Jesus when he tried to run away from the citizens of Nineveh, he ran away from God. You see, if you've ever played baseball, you know that a baseball bat has a sweet spot on it. It's that one particular spot on that bat. When you hit the ball there, the ball just goes the furthest. You see, when you hit it there just perfectly and get it in that sweet spot, everything, you feel it, everything feels perfect. See, you hit it in the sweet spot, you could hit it, the ball out of the park. But the truth is, with relationships, most people are just hitting ground balls to first base. Today, as we continue our series, The Sweet Spot, last week we looked at sort of a career choice you could make in sweet spots. Today, we're going to look at relationships. You need to be discerning. You need to be discriminating in your relationships. May I suggest that maybe you unfriend some people that are toxic and avoid some people in your life that are just negative and bring you down. Just sort of a, a friendly tip to you. Never be friends with anyone who calls movies cinema. Movies aren't cinema, go back to France. But anyways, most people aren't reliable. I remember this little joke. These two friends who were camping out in the woods and they were sleeping in a tent. 
they woke up in the morning they heard a whole bunch of growling and noise coming from outside the woods and they poked their heads outside the tent and they saw coming out of the bush a large grizzly bear making its way coming towards them the run friend jumped up and began to get ready to run away from the grizzly bear the other one got up and he started to put his shoes on very slowly he said what are you doing putting your shoes on isn't going to make you run faster than that grizzly bear you can't outrun a grizzly bear and the one friend calmly looked at his other friend and said oh that's okay I don't need to outrun the grizzly bear I just got to outrun you people will let you down so you have a choice our one simple truth today is this my relationship with Jesus is most important my relationship with Jesus is most important relationships come with ups and down you get them light right and life feels amazing that feels like they are worth living they feel like a great movie that you're in the middle of but when you get relationships wrong they make life horrible they make life depressing they make life like an Adam Sandler movie but my relationship with Jesus though isn't like that it's not up and down Jesus is my rock you see, the lesson for today is all about relationships. And let me take a moment and address one type of relationship. Most relationships that give us the greatest trouble are the romantic relationships. They're that relationships that just tear your heart out. They are those relationships when you're young, you, you work overtime to buy her something special and then she turns around and brings another guy to church and just tears your heart out, right? Those romantic relationships. They tend to dominate most of our relationship issues. So let me just address them before we continue. I'm going to give you a few relationship priority mistakes if you're taking notes. The first mistake is the attraction mistake. Attraction isn't wrong. It's okay to be attracted to another individual. But when you make attraction your top priority, you're making a big mistake. The second mistake is the selfish goals. This is the what I get out of this relationship is my goal. Just sort of a, a little tip, a little idea. Start to go through your relationships and how you talk about your relationships and see how many times you use the word I when describing them. This can also be true with God about how I feel, what I get out of it, how this is impacting me. And third is the physical experience. The physical experience can bring a lot of negative. It can bring some positive, but that physical experience can bring some major issues. It can bring disease, heartbreaks. It can bring things that can never be undone or cured. So the sweet spot for a relationship, let's leave the romantic side and let's be a little more general about all relationships. The sweet spot of for a relationship is number one, if we go back to our Venn diagram of three circles overlapping each other. First is common interest. As a Christian, the number one common interest, if you're going to be involved with somebody in a romantic way, the number one common interest is Jesus. You date, you marry uh, believers, you don't be unequally yoked. But let me say this to you even further, a common interest. How can you have such a struggle in your church if your same common interest isn't Jesus? So many churches and Christian organizations are struggling today, and they're struggling today because the focus of what they have is not Jesus. Sometimes their focus can be good things. Sometimes they're things that I might even personally agree with and in my own personal life. But their focus is not Jesus. In all of our relationships, in order for them to find the sweet spot, they have to be a relationship equally yoked, focused on Jesus. Secondly, our sweet spot for a relationship is compatible personalities. You know, and romantically, you can only kiss for so long, but eventually you have to talk. Some of the best relationships I have with, with men are relationships when I share a, a similar sports interest. If they like my team, if, if they are in, in, in centered around the team I like, well, we do really well. If they like teams from Ohio, particularly Ohio State, I have found that I don't get along as well with them. Center your relationships on the compatibility that you have with Jesus. And number three is character. Can I just address the young, again, young ladies? I do, when you say I do, does not change a person's character. Don't marry a project. Don't marry a fixer-upper. Mary, a man of God. And as we look at those three circles that overlap from character and compatibility and common interest, it is in the center of those three circles we find the sweet spot. And unfortunately, most people never get this with all three, all three things of their relationships. It often takes years of failed relationships and pain to fully understand what you're supposed to do. 
But this brings me back though, this, these three circles bring me back to our one simple truth. Make my most important relationship with Jesus. You see, religion can't forgive you. It can only condemn and judge you. Religion can't get you to heaven. Only a relationship with Jesus Christ can forgive you and get you to heaven. And inside the center of those three circles, this is our relationship with Jesus. Really? Let's look at it. A common interest? Jesus is crazy about you. I mean, he thinks you're amazing. He loves you so much he died for you. Compatible personality? Personality? He came to earth just to be one of us. He knows what it's like to be human. He was tested and tempted in all areas. And character? Ah, oh, you will never find anyone with a better character than Jesus. So when Jonah ran, he was running from that relationship. He was running from God. He wasn't running from the, the Ninevites and from what he perceived as danger. He was running from the best relationship he ever had. So what happened when he ran? Well, in Jonah 1, God causes a horrible storm to happen. Jonah admits to the sailors on the boat he's on. He admits that he's the reason. He convinces the sailors to throw him overboard. It's amazing that these sailors take a while before they throw Jonah overboard. So look at verse 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. A little cross-reference in your Bible. Put down Matthew 8, 23 and 27. Matthew 8, 23 and 27. And in that passage, Jesus calms the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Look, repeatedly, Jesus is in control of the storms in our life. I don't know why he sometimes allows it to feel like the water is crashing over our bowels. Maybe he just wants to get our attention. I don't know why he makes it feel like the clouds are dark and they're never going to light up. Maybe he wants to be the light of our life. I don't know why, but I know this. The only one who can calm the storm is Jesus. In verse 16, and what's the result? The men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. It's amazing when God judges his people, holiness is the norm and his name is praised. Don't believe me? Check out Acts chapter 5 when Ananias and Sapphira are judged by God. But back to verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish. Let's just stop for a moment. It doesn't say whale. The Hebrew word that is used here is not the word for whale. God just created a fish. Verse 17 to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. You say, I don't necessarily believe that literally happened and that's actually real, Pastor Steve. Well, Jesus believed it. Jesus believed it was three days and three nights. In fact, Matthew 12, 40 says this, this is Jesus, for as Jonah was three days and nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You see, there are historic stories that I could point out of sailors who were actually, and these are historic facts, who were actually found alive inside a, a, a fish or a whale for multiple days. The Bible says in the Old Testament, it says fish. All I know is God made it, whether it's a fish or a whale, whether it was a mammal or whatever. God made this animal special for this situation. We get so sidetracked about the story of Jonah on some of these silly issues. Look, here's what I know of this. It's in the Bible, so I believe it. And even if that wasn't enough, Jesus believed it. And if Jesus believes it, that's good enough for me. We don't really have to defend anything. We don't have to justify anything. If Jesus believes it, that's all we need to know. I'm reminded of this little story. This little girl was talking to her teacher, who was obviously a, a strong liberal, about whales. And the little girl started to tell the teacher about Jonah. And the teacher stopped the little girl and said, oh, sweetheart, it's not possible for a human being to be swallowed by a whale and to, to live. The little girl said, well, you know what? When I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah how it happened and how it was possible. The teacher, thinking that maybe she got the little girl cornered, said, well, what are you going to do if uh, Jonah didn't go to heaven, but Jonah went to hell? And the little girl, without missing a beat, said, well, well, then you ask him. Look, the whale isn't the story. Jonah and his response is the story. And the focus of the story is the faithfulness of God and really 
the center of it is that we need Jesus because every verse and every word in the Bible is focused on the fact that we need Jesus. Jonah chapter 2 and verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. This is the first time Jonah prays. Don't wait until you're in a fish's belly in a disaster to start praying and talking to God. Pray before it. Maybe it'll keep you out of the whale. Verse 2. And said, I cried by my, re my reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Stop there for a moment. Isn't that beautiful? I know this, that when I was a young boy and I came to the realization that I was a sinner who needed Jesus, I cried unto the Lord. There in my front room in Shelby Township on Mound Road, in the front room bedroom on the upstairs, I got down on my knees and I cried to the Lord. And you know what? Just like Jonah, the Lord heard me and Jesus saved me. Out of the belly of, the, of hell. Hell there is the word shoal. It means a place of catastrophe. It's not the place where those who don't know Christ as their Savior will go. Cried I, and, her, and thou heardest my voice. Right next to verse 2, one simple word. If you like to put notes in your Bible, write this word, grace. God shouldn't have spared his life. If Jonah got what he deserved, God would turn his back on him here. God definitely shouldn't have listened to him, but yet God allowed grace to step in, and Jonah is not getting what he deserves. You see, this isn't religion. This is a relationship. A great test of any, the strength of any relationship is forgiveness. Can someone forgive the other person? So let's conclude our message today. My relationship with Jesus getting it in the sweet spot of our life. My relationship with Jesus, number one, has no expiration. Jonah did not stop being in God's family. Just because he ran from God and turned his back on God, God did not take him out of the family. In fact, God went after him. I'm reminded of what Jesus says in John, that it is not us holding on to God's hand. It is God holding on to our hand. It is Jesus holding on. God puts us in his hand and we can never get out. One of the doctrines that we believe is eternal security. And the reason we believe it is all of our doctrine and everything we do at Cross Creek is focused on Jesus. Every doctrine we have has to deal with what does this say to us about Jesus? And what eternal security says to me about Jesus is that Jesus is faithful. He is a friend that sticketh closer than the brother. He will never leave us nor forsake us. You can walk away from him. You can turn your back on him like Jonah did. But Jesus' character is so great, he will never walk away from you. That is grace. If you're taking notes in the fish, Jonah had a time to pray. In the fish, God had Jonah's attention. Maybe that's why God is putting you inside a fish in your life. Jesus isn't done with you, though. Grace demands a second chance. Today is your second chance. Get your relationship with Jesus back in the sweet spot. If you've never accepted him as Savior today, ask him to be your Savior and come into your heart. If you're a believer in Jesus and Christ, and oh, we all wander, we all get things in our head, we all think about things and try, whatever you have done or thought of, come back to Jesus. Because grace demands a second chance. Number two, my relationship with Jesus, getting it in the sweet spot, has no expense. Jesus is free. If you're taking notes, Jesus is free. There are times I hear people talk about what they have to do to get into heaven, how they have good they have to be, or things they have to do to get into heaven. I think back to the, the movie, The Karate Kid. Being a child of the 80s, it was one of the more popular movies in that time, and I, I really liked it. But looking back on that movie, it really frustrates me. If you know the movie at the the end of the movie, the, 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 the hero of the movie has sort of a broken leg and he's kind of standing there in what's called a flamingo stance. The other guy he's fighting just has one simple thing he has to do. Just don't walk forward. Just don't walk forward and the guy can't beat you. He can barely defend himself. He can only do one thing. All you have to do is don't walk forward. And time again, when you watch that movie, every single time he walks forward and gets kicked in the face, Look, when it comes to Jesus Christ as your Savior, 
All you have to do is one thing. Accept Christ as your Savior. It is free. There is no expense. There is nothing you can do. He died for you before you were born. He chose you before the foundation of the earth. He loved you and came to be born of a virgin and die on the cross 33 years after that. He cares about you. He is the greatest relationship you will ever have. All you have to do is one thing. Accept Jesus as your Savior today. And my relationship with Jesus, it has no pain. It has no pain. You see, for most people, relationships just don't work. They try and they try again, and they, they just keep figuratively getting hit in the face time and time again. I think of the movie Polar Express. I'm using movies a lot today. But I think of the movie The Polar Express, and there's a line in it with the little poor, poor boy in the movie says, Christmas just doesn't work out for me. Maybe you feel like that. Maybe you feel like, you know what? Every time I've tried to love someone, they have just let me down. The people that are supposed to be my family have stabbed me in the back. And you know, I was part of a church once and I got involved in those Christians. Boy, they couldn't wait to, to let me know who I was and to judge me. May I say to you that we all have stories like that. We can all kind of rally around you or we can run to Jesus because Jesus isn't that way. He brings no pain. He only gives and gives and gives. Jesus will never do that to you. He will never use you, discard you, judge you. He is your first and best relationship. I want to as I start to wrap this up, I want to give you what I'm just going to call a crisis statement. If you're in the middle of a crisis, if you feel like everything is collapsing around you, I want to give you this one simple crisis statement. Write this down. Remember this phrase and say it back to yourself. Maybe yell it out loud. Jesus would never do that to me. Jesus would never do that to me. Other people will let you down, hurt you, stab you in the back, but Jesus will never do that to me. That healing statement came to me from a, a very good friend. At the time, I was going through and doing this little exercise, and I was taking Romans 6, 7, and 8, and I printed them out on a piece of paper, and I made it into two columns. The one on the left had all the Bible verses, and the one on the right was blank. And I went through those famous chapters of Romans 6, 7, and 8, and I started circling passages and writing on the blank side what, what those passages said about how Jesus felt about me, about how important I was to Jesus, and what... Jesus saw when he saw me. Other people saw mistakes and other people saw somebody who was unlovable. But I constantly saw how grace stepped in and how much Jesus loved me in those passages. And I remember writing the, the thing and the very last thing I wrote at the end of it was simply this. He loves me. Of all the statements I could ever say about Jesus, about his faithfulness and kindness, about his ability to give second chances, I would like to say to you the greatest statement about Jesus that I could ever make and you could ever make. He loves me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. I want to close with a story. A pastor in Tennessee named Reverend Chris Edmonds discovered a secret about his father. His father was U.S. Army Master Sergeant Rodney Edmonds. His dad died in 1985, and it was years later that he discovered this secret about his dad, kind of researching his dad and going online and hearing different stories. And these are stories his dad never told him. His father was in World War II. And more specifically, he was in the European theater, and he was in the Battle of the Bulge. And that Battle of the Bulge was that German sort of last gasp on Christmas Day of 1944 to try to push the Americans out of France and, and try to regain uh, Europe. They caught the Americans by surprise and took thousands and thousands of prisoners there in 1944. He was the highest ranking non-commissioned officer and he found himself there in a POW camp, really in charge of a thousand plus men. The German commander came to him and spoke to him in English. And he told him as the head officer there, he demanded that he present and tell him all the Jews that are in his group. He wanted to know who the Jews were. You don't need to know too much about history to know why he wanted to do that at the time in 1944. 
the Germans were losing the war, but they were increasing their, their concentration camps and killing and slaughtering Jewish people. Sergeant Edmonds knew exactly what this man wanted. He told the other POWs, we are not doing that. We all fall out together. With the camp's inmates the defiantly standing in front of their barracks, the German commander came up to Sergeant Edmonds and said, they can't all be Jews. Mr. Edmonds replied simply, we are all Jews. With that sort of rebellious camaraderie statement, the commander of that Nazis took out his pistol and he put it to the head of Sergeant Edmonds. And he told him, you have one more chance to tell me who the Jews are or I will kill you. Sergeant Edmund says, if you are going to shoot, then shoot. But know this, we know who you are and you will be tried for war crimes because we will win this war. And at that, Sergeant Edmonds restated the statement, we are all Jews. Over 200 Jewish Americans had their life saved because of this brave United States soldier on that day. You see, isn't that the relationships we want? Isn't that sort of our human relationships? We want a relationship like that. We want somebody that we can count on. We want somebody that we, we could be, we know will honor their commitment to us. We want somebody we can be proud of. We want somebody who's sacrificial to us. Well, if that's what you want, then why don't you go do that? Why don't you honor your commitments? Why don't you be honorable to the people that are counting on you? Why don't you live a life that people can be proud about what you're doing? Why don't you sacrifice for those other people around you? If you want that type of relationship in your life you're going to have to be that type of person and give it to someone else but let me say this to you isn't that Jesus when we were destined to hell Jesus stepped forward and said I will die for them when we were bound to an eternity separated from all from God forever Jesus bore the shame of the cross and because of what he did we can say we are all Christians and because of Jesus, we will win this war. Be that type of person. You'll never get that type of relationship until you are that type of person to someone else. But before you do any of that, make Jesus the most important relationship in your life. When you get Jesus right, you will be surprised at how many other relationships you get right and how many relationships you need to get rid of will automatically want nothing to do with you. Get Jesus right. He is the most important relationship you could have. So you've been hurt. You've been stabbed in the back. You've been betrayed. You can either run from everybody in the world and never have any type of relationship and let the people who've done the worst and most horrible things to you win and let them dictate your life. Or you can run to Jesus. He will never let you down. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He will never leave you nor forsake you. We are all Christians. We will win this war. Join me in prayer. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, if someone is listening to this and hearing this, whether it's online or over the radio, Lord, please let them come to know you as personal Savior. Father, if there's a believer who's struggling because they've been hurt by other people, Father, help them not to turn their back on church, Help them not to turn their back on other Christians, but most importantly, help them not to turn their back on you. Let them not get focused on people, but focused on you and run to you. Thank you, Lord, that when we were like Jonah and deserved you to turn your back on us, you heard us in the middle of that fish. Thank you, Father, for loving us. And thank you for the message of the cross. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us this Sunday. Have a great day.